In this video, we're going to introduce simple harmonic motion, and then we're going to use the principles of simple harmonic motion to describe the motion of a mass oscillating on a spring. So pictured on the screen here, we have a device known as a Scots yoke. And the Scots yoke is used to translate rotational motion into linear motion. So pictured in blue, we have a rotating disc, and that rotating disc is going to have an angular velocity, omega. There is a pin attached to the disc, and the pin is free to move in the slot of the yoke. So pictured in white, we have the yoke. Now, because the yoke is constrained, so it can only move in the vertical direction like so, then as the disc rotates, the pin moves through the slot, and as the pin moves through the slot, the vertical position of point P at the bottom is going to change. So from its current position, as the disc rotates clockwise, the pin is going to move downwards, and once the pin reaches the bottom position, and the rotation continues, the point P is going to move upwards. Now by definition, simple harmonic motion is when a particle is constantly being accelerated back to a centre point. So if we consider point P, and we have a centre line here, then the point P is going to move downwards away from its centre line, and then it's going to move back upwards past its centre line, and then it's going to move downwards back towards its centre line. The point here is the acceleration is always back towards that centre point, meaning the force acting on the yoke is also always acting towards that centre line, and this will become more apparent when we look at the example of a mass oscillating on a spring. So the important things here are the displacement is going to change periodically because the position of point P is oscillating up and down, so the position of point P is going to oscillate. In addition to that, the velocity of point P is going to oscillate. This is linear velocity, meaning the velocity is going to increase to a peak value, and then it's going to drop to zero, and then it's going to increase to a negative peak value before returning back to zero. And in actual fact, the acceleration is also going to change periodically. As we said, that's always going to be acting towards the centre. The further point P is away from the centre, the larger the amplitude of the acceleration. Let's relate this theory to a mass oscillating on a spring, and then we'll take a look at some graphs of displacement, velocity and acceleration. OK, so here we have a similar example of simple harmonic motion because what we have is we have a mass suspended on a spring, and before we displace that mass, it's going to sit on the dashed centre line. Until we introduce a displacement to that system, the mass is going to have a natural resting position. But when we displace the mass through a distance x0, or an initial displacement, and release the mass, it's going to oscillate up and down past that centre line. So once again, its displacement is going to change periodically, and its displacement is going to oscillate above and below the centre line. Its velocity is going to change periodically, because at the top and bottom of the motion, the velocity is going to be zero. And as it passes the centre line, the velocity is going to be maximum. And the acceleration also changes periodically. As we said, the acceleration, or the force, always acts towards the centre line, and the magnitude is dependent on the distance from the centre line. So the further we are from the centre line, the larger the acceleration, acting back towards the centre line, and therefore the larger the force. It's easier to visualise the force with a spring, because the more the spring is extended, the larger the force, trying to pull the mass back to the centre line. And the more the spring is compressed, the larger the force, trying to restore the mass back to the centre line. So the force and the acceleration act towards the centre line. Now, there's a few things that are going to affect the displacement, velocity, and accelerations. And one of those things is going to be the mass of the object. And another variable is going to be the stiffness of the spring. K represents the spring stiffness. And we'll do some calculations around these in a moment to see how these different variables impact on the oscillations. 
but in general terms, the stiffer the spring, the lower the displacement's going to be about the center line, but the greater the acceleration's going to be. The stiffer the spring, the greater the force, the greater the force, the greater the acceleration back towards the center. Okay, let's look at some graphs to see what's happening here. So the first thing to notice here is that the periodic time for all three of these traces is the same. We have the displacement first of all, and the displacement starts at its maximum value here and completes one full cycle when it gets to this point here. So that represents the periodic time for the displacement. We can do the same for the acceleration because the acceleration at time t equals zero has a value of minus 10 in this example or its minimum value. And it returns to its minimum value after one cycle, which is the same point where one full cycle was completed for the displacement. And finally, the same is true for the velocity. The velocity starts at zero and it returns to zero at the same point as our other two traces. So the periodic time for all three of these graphs is exactly the same. The other important thing to notice is that when the displacement is maximum or minimum, so we have a maximum displacement over here, and we have a minimum displacement around here, what we notice is that the velocity is zero. And that makes sense when you think about it because our mass is oscillating about a central value. When it reaches the top of its motion, it's going to stop. It's no longer going to have any velocity before it continues moving to the bottom of its motion where it will stop again before the cycle can repeat. It's basically where the velocity switches from being positive to negative because we have positive velocity moving upwards and we have negative velocity moving downwards. And the other important point to note there is when our displacement is maximum, so maximum negative, or in the bottom position on our diagram in the bottom left hand corner, so when the mass is in this position, the acceleration is maximum positive as we see represented on our graph here. And the reason for that is because the acceleration always acts towards the center, and the further we are away from the center line, the greater the acceleration. Note that negative displacement is positive acceleration, because when the mass is below the center line, the acceleration is acting upwards, and vice versa. Now, returning to the graph itself, we have all of the same features that we would expect on a sinusoidal graph. We have the amplitude, which is the peak value. We have the periodic time, as we mentioned previously. We have the frequency, which is the number of full cycles completed every second. And we also have our angular frequency, which was easier to visualize with the Scott's yoke because the angular frequency omega was the angular speed of the rotating disk. But even with the mass spring system, we're still going to have an angular frequency. So let's take a look at a practical example involving a mass on a spring so that we can calculate things such as the peak displacement, the peak velocity, and the peak acceleration. Okay, so in this example, we have a mass of 45 kilograms suspended on a spring of stiffness 35 kilonewtons per meter. And let's go for an initial displacement equal to 125 millimeters. Now we're okay to work in millimeters, providing we remember that our displacement will be in millimeters, our velocity will be in millimeters per second, and our acceleration will be in millimeters per second squared. And we're going to find the displacement, velocity, and acceleration after 0.1 seconds has elapsed. So the first thing that we need to do is determine the natural angular frequency of oscillation. And the formula for this is the square root of k over m. Well, we have values for these. We have a value of k of 35 kilonewtons per meter. So we need to remember that kilo is a thousand, 
and we have a mass of 45 kilograms. That gives us an omega value equal to 27.89. And that's measured in radians per second. From that, we can determine the frequency of our oscillations, which is the number of oscillations per second, as well as our periodic time. So our natural frequency equals 1 over 2 pi root k over m, which is the same as our angular frequency over 2 pi. Recall that omega equals 2 pi f. Therefore, f equals omega over 2 pi. Now that gives us a value for our frequency equal to 4.439 to 3 decimal places. And frequency is measured in hertz. Now finally, we can work out the periodic time. And this is the periodic time for the displacement, velocity and acceleration, as we mentioned previously. And periodic time is just 1 over frequency. There are various different formulas you can use for this, but the simplest is 1 over frequency, giving us a periodic time equal to 0 0.225 seconds. So every 0 0.225 seconds, the displacement, velocity and acceleration are all going to complete one full cycle. Now, the only value that we need there for our displacement, velocity and acceleration calculations is the value of the natural angular frequency of oscillation. So we'll make a note of that value and then we'll calculate the displacement, velocity and acceleration 0.1 seconds after the mass has been released from its starting position x0 below the centre line. So from our formula sheets, we know that the displacement at time t equals amplitude cos omega t plus thi. Now, when we're looking at a mass oscillating on a spring and the mass is starting from the bottom position, we can disregard the phase angle. So for the purpose of a mass oscillating on a spring, we can remove our phase angle because it's starting from the bottom of the motion, like so. Now the omega value here is our natural angular frequency, which we calculated as 27.89. We're using a time of 0.1 seconds, and A represents our initial displacement, x0. Now we have to take a little bit of care here, and we need to apply a convention. If we say that anything below the line is negative, then anything above the line is positive. So what we can see is that our initial displacement here is actually negative. It's important to be clear on this because when we calculate our velocities or accelerations, we want to know how they compare with our displacement in terms of the directions that they're acting and so on. So in this example, the amplitude or the initial displacement is actually minus 125. So we have minus 125 cos 27.89 times 0 0.1, like so. You need to make sure that your calculator's in radians because we have a time variable here. And radians is actually the SI units for an angle, so we must use radians for this calculation. But with our calculator in radians, when we run that through the calculator, we get 117.30. We know it's millimetres because our initial displacement was in millimetres. So although our initial displacement was 125 millimetres below the centre line, after 0.1 seconds, we're 117.3 millimetres above the line. So we've almost completed a half cycle there. Let's calculate our velocity. And the velocity at time t can be found by differentiating the expression for displacement. So differentiating a cos omega t is minus omega a 
sine omega t. These formulas are provided on the equations and information sheet if you need to refer to those. But plugging in our values, we have minus 27.89 times, and again take care here, a is a minus. So we have a minus times a minus sine 27.89 times our time of 0.1 seconds. Now running that through the calculator gives us 1204 millimetres per second accurate to the nearest whole number. Now finally we can calculate our acceleration. Now because our displacement is positive we already know that we're expecting a negative answer for our acceleration. And to get our acceleration, all we need to do is differentiate our velocity formula. Now, this actually gives us a relatively simple expression. What we'll end up with is minus omega squared times our displacement. The reason being is because minus sine differentiates to minus cos. So what we have is something that relates very closely to our displacement. Therefore, we have minus 27.89 squared times 117.30, giving us an acceleration equal to minus 91,242 millimetres per second squared. So we can see that the acceleration is very large, as we would expect, as we're quite some distance away from the centre line, and it has the opposite sign to our displacement. So just as a quick summary, the first thing we need to do is calculate our natural angular frequency using the mass and the spring stiffness. We can then calculate our displacement after a given time, and we calculated the displacement after 0.1 seconds, but we needed to take care because we were displacing the mass downwards, our amplitude or our initial displacement also needed to be negative. We were then able to calculate our velocity, once again noting that our value of a was negative, and finally we calculated the acceleration, noting that the acceleration was negative because the displacement was positive.